Thank you, Shar, and your team for leading us this evening. Appreciate it so much. Good evening, church. It's good to see you. Thank you for saying good evening really loud, making it sound like there's 267 people in here. It's great. Yeah, for sure. It's a pleasure to worship the Lord with you tonight. It's an honor to do so. Today is our fifth and final message on the book of the Bible called Joel, written by the prophet named Joel, obviously. Joel was a prophet and a a spokesperson for God, someone who uh, spoke on behalf of the Lord to his people. Now, when we think of prophets, we often think of prophecies, things, them predicting things that will happen in the future. And uh, this, this passage that we're going to look at today in Joel actually contains some of that, that information. But prophets didn't just foretell things, they would foretell as well. In other words, they would, they would talk about God's requirements for his people, what, what God's path looked like in life, how to get back on his path if they had veered off of his path. And Joel does this um, often as well in, his, in this particular book. Now, during Joel's time, Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, which he was prophesying to, was not walking on God's path. Their worship of God was not wholehearted in nature. They were people who were distracted by lesser things or things that were just plain inappropriate and wrong. And God, in this moment, was seeking to get his people's attention. He was shaking them up and uh, seeking to, uh, to grab a hold of them and, and to draw them closer to himself ultimately in the end. So what did God do in this moment? Going back to chapter one, he shuts the tap off. He, he, he stops the rain from coming. They have a drought. And then he brings this swarm and sw- more, more swarms of locusts. What little was growing was eaten up by these, these insects, this infestation that they experienced. This was the first day of the Lord that Joel talks about here in chapter one. The second day of the Lord we looked at in chapter 2 and Joel talked about this invading army that would one day come and, and invade Judah and, and devastate Judah as well. And we see this either decades, maybe even just years later in, from Joel's prophecy. We see the Assyrian army coming into Judah, 720 uh, B.C., uh, or is it 70, I think 701 BC, and they came in and they, and they, they devastated, devastated the uh, country of Judah and then they surrounded the, the city of Jerusalem and, and were ready to besiege it. They, at this point, um, Hezekiah goes into the temple and he, he, throws his, he throws himself on the floor of the temple. Now, he knew this verse that Joel, was, uh, was talk, that Joel mentions here in chapter 2. Joel tells his people in these moments, these days of the Lord, he says, Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Historically, when God's people were in mourning, when they were devastated, they would tear their garments as a sign of their mourning and their grief. And God says, stop ripping open your garments and rip open your heart and expose it to me so that I can heal it, so that I can come into it and and put it in order because their hearts were out of order in this moment. Confess your sinful ways for me and turn from them and open up to your heart, to my cleansing, to my work that I long to do in it. So Assyria surrounded uh, the city of Jerusalem. Hezekiah went into the temple and poured his heart out to the Lord. It doesn't talk about him confessing, but I'm guessing that there was a lot of confession in this moment. Not only his own personal sins, but the sins of his country. And he pleads for God to have mercy and to relent, to, to change his mind, if you will, in this moment. And God relented. The Assyrian army was struck down. As we know the story, 185,000 soldiers died in one night. Then in Joel chapter 3, Joel talks about a future day of the Lord, much bigger than a swarm of locusts, much bigger than 185,000 soldiers surrounding your city, much bigger than that. This day of the Lord in chapter 3 that we've we've run into is the final day of the Lord when history as we know it will come to a close and a new chapter will begin for mankind. Now towards the end of this or the close of this, this day, we often call it the end times. That's a common phrase in our church language, the end times. 
According to the Bible, as we near the end of this day of the Lord, things will get worse on planet Earth. There will be famines and earthquakes and volcanoes. The Earth will be, will be just reacting strongly to what's going on. There will be injustices all over the, all over the globe. There will, be, there will be conflicts and wars. People will live for themselves even more than they do today. There will be, all the order will be turned into chaos. Sounds a little bit like the news today, doesn't it? And in the midst of all this chaos, the world will look for a savior to save them from all of their troubles. Some will look to Jesus, but the more of them will look to a man who will rise up according to God's word, a charismatic person who will rise up and promise them order, who will promise them better days ahead. And he will, he will gain the control of all of the world and then eventually all the, the armies of the world will descend upon Israel and there will be a battle there. We talked about that last week in Israel. And God in this moment would protect his people, Israel. Everyone versus God's people. But what everyone forgot when, that, those, armies, when those armies will descend on Israel, what they forgot is that God's people have God on their side. And that's an important thing to recognize. It's like, like Aslan in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. When Aslan shows up, he protects his people and defeats his enemies. And Jesus will show up as well and defeat the enemies of God. And like every good story has a conclusion, this, uh, this one does as well. And we're going to look at some of the conclusion today. Not all of it, but some of it. Now remember, this is not just a story. It's not a fairy tale. This is God's story. And though we might not understand or comprehend every part of his story, um, we know that in the end, as the sun sets on this final day of the Lord, God is still on the throne of the universe. Let's be very clear about that. God is still on the throne. And with him are his people still standing as well. Don't forget that important truth. Turn with me to the book of Joel as we finish off this incredible little book, Joel chapter three. I'm gonna ask you to stand with me as we read the word of the Lord. Joel chapter three. We're gonna begin reading at verse 16. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the sky will tremble but the Lord will be a refuge for his people and a stronghold for the people of Israel. Verse 17. Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her. In that day, the mountains will drip with new wine and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of acacias. Some of your Bibles say the word shittim, which means acacias. But Egypt will be desolate, Edom a desert waste because of the violence done to the people of Judah, in whose land they shed innocent blood. Judah will be inhabited forever in Jerusalem through all the generations. Their blood guilt, which I have not pardoned, I will pardon. The Lord dwells in Zion. Let's pause and let's pray. I confess to you, Father, I love happy endings. And we are so grateful, Lord, that as we look at the conclusion of this day of the Lord, that it ends happily for, for you, your people and also for you. We thank you that you are the Lion of Judah, that you are the Lamb of God who gave up his life for us. And we... Um, we draw tremendous hope and strength from this truth this day. And I pray, Lord, that as we continue to work our way through this incredible little book that you, uh, that you uh, revealed to Joel so many years ago, Father, I pray that you would reveal once again your truth to us as well. That we would leave with more hope, with more strength, encouraged people, ready for people, people who are ready to face the day ahead of us. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we pray things now. These things in the amazing name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please have a seat. Verse 16. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and sky will tremble. 
but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. Listen to how the prophet Zechariah, a prophet later on in history, describes this moment. Zechariah 14, verses 3 and 4 says this, Then the Lord, Yahweh, will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. And on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two, from east to west, forming a great valley with half the mountain moving north and half moving south. So Jesus, the Lion of Judah, our warrior God, he will make a grand entrance. He will descend from heaven like he ascended to heaven so many years ago. And he will land on the Mount of Olives, that mountain just east of Jerusalem, just across the Kidron Valley from Jerusalem. And it will be split in two, forming a valley from east to west. And then Jesus will defeat the enemies of God in that moment. And ultimately, this is what's happening in this moment. Just as Jesus came to earth to proclaim the kingdom of God, his rule and his reign over all of creation, just as Jesus came to earth to die and come back to life to become the true and rightful king of the universe, Jesus, who has been empowering his people to bring about the kingdom of God here on planet earth for centuries, will now fully bring about the kingdom of God here on this planet. We will not live forever in heaven I hope this doesn't shock you. We will live on a planet that is made completely new. God will bring his kingdom to this earth and we will live here forever with the Lord. In Revelation chapter 11, an angel acting as a herald blows his trumpet and he proclaims this, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah and he will reign forever and ever. The king will return then amazing to think about? The king is going to come back. Joel continues in verse 17, Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her. God will not just watch over his people. He will not just fight for his people. As amazing as that is, God will actually be with his people. He will live with his people. And his presence will bring about his holiness in the city of God. This holiness, this word means that God is set apart. He is perfect. He, he is he's different in a good way. And his holiness will make his kingdom, the kingdom of God, holy. And we're going to talk about how that happens here in a few moments. Verse 18, In that day the mountains will drip new wine and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water and a fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Shittim or the valley of Acacias. Now remember back in Deuteronomy when God reveals to his people how to live a thriving, flourishing sort of a life, he tells his people that if they choose to not walk on his path, that he will not bless his people, that they will experience hardship and drought and pests, that, that foreign People will come and invade their country, that they would, in fact, be taken from their country if it came to that. Now, we know as New Testament Christians that, that when hard things happen, it isn't always because we are living in disobedience, but sometimes it is because we are living in disobedience and God is seeking to get our attention. He's disciplining us as his people. But God almost also, sorry, he also promised that if his people lived the kind of life they were supposed to live, that if they walked on his path, that they would be a blessed people. Hard things would still happen once in a while, but ultimately they would be a blessed people. The rains would come, the crops would, would, would produce, they would have many children. They would live to see their children's children. And here Joel is saying that the kingdom of God is all about abundance. The grapes will be abundant Wine, which represents joy in the Bible, will just be flowing. There'll be so much joy in God's kingdom. And all the ravines, all the wadis, as they call them in Israel, will run with water. Now this is saying something because a lot of Israel is quite dry country. The wadis rarely want run with water. Only if there's a, a rainstorm will they run with water. But here the word of God says that the wadis, the valleys, will just, will just flow water all the time. 
Joel proclaims this message, remember, in the midst of a drought. You can just imagine the people just, they can almost taste the water, I think, as Joel was talking about what the kingdom of God was going to be like. One day, when God's kingdom is fully established, the droughts will all be in the past, the ground will flourish, the ground that's even usually dry will, will grow things, will be abundant, as will God's people. And a fountain will flow out of the Lord's house. God will be with his people, his house will be with them, and he will pour out his blessings physically, spiritually, in every sort of way, his blessings on his people. This is when I start to get excited. Joel pictures this fountain flowing out from the Temple Mount. And this isn't the only time in Scripture that, that, the, that the, uh, the biblical writers talk about a fountain. I'm going to read a couple different instances. Zechariah 14, verse 8 says, On that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half to the eastern sea, the Dead Sea, and half to the western sea, the Mediterranean. Both in summer and in winter, it will not be a seasonal flow. It'll be all year round. And it's not just water, it's living water. Water that brings refreshment and brings life. Ezekiel talks about this as well in Ezekiel 37. He says, when it, meaning the river flowing from the fountain of the house of God, when it empties into the Dead Sea, the water there becomes fresh. Imagine that, those of you that have been to the Dead Sea. Imagine that water becoming fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because the water from the fountain of God's house flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. If you know anything about the Dead Sea, you'll know that it's nearly nine times saltier than the ocean itself. You go there, and there's a reason why they call it the Dead Sea. Because beyond just a few little microbes that live close to some freshwater springs that are coming in at the bottom of the sea, it is dead. Nothing can live in that sea because it's so full of salt and minerals. Then, but one day, according to Joel and other prophets like Ezekiel and, and Zechariah, one day it will no longer be dead. One day living water will flow from the fountain of God's house on God's holy mountain to the Dead Sea, and it will have to be renamed. How are they going to do that, hey? Maybe a committee will have to take care of that. But why? Because like Frankenstein, it's alive, right? The Dead Sea comes to life. It lives. How does it live? Because God's living water flows into it. A sentence or two later, Ezekiel proclaims this. He says, Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit. I, I get a little excited about that. Right? Right now it's just July and August. These two months but Ezekiel says every month these trees will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them and it brings life to them. They never lose their leaves. Their fruit will serve for food and get this, their leaves for healing. Isn't that amazing? The Apostle John echoes this image in the, in the book of Revelation centuries later. He says in Revelation 22, the end the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life. There it is again. We lost it in Genesis chapter 3 and here it pops up in Revelation 22. On each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Boy, we need those leaves right now, don't we? We need the nations to be healed. From these scriptures, we recognize that God is a providing sort of God, both today and forever. Our God is a healing God, both today and forever as well. The brokenness that we experience in our lives, God begins the process of healing us in this life, but in, 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 in the kingdom someday, he will complete the process within us and just bring us to a place of full and complete healing and wholeness. We will be healed completely. Every element of our brokenness will be put back together again. 
Not only that, but the living waters from this fountain do something else as well. Zechariah 13 says this, On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I get that to mean the the citizens of God's kingdom, including you and I, if we're followers of Christ today, to cleanse them from sin and from impurity. Earlier, Joel told us that Jerusalem, the kingdom of God, would be holy, would be set apart, would be pure. Why? Because we have all drank from this living water. Back in the 18th century, a a gentleman named William Cooper wrote this song. There is a fountain filled with what? With blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. It continues, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Now, if you just walked into church for the first time in your life, you're wondering, what is going on here? A fountain with blood? Sounds a little bit morbid. Yet when we recognize that this fountain, this living water, cleanses our sin, that it removes our guilt, that it takes away our shame, it makes complete sense that Cooper would say that this fountain is filled with our Savior's, our King's blood, because only the shed blood of Jesus could do this for us. Amen? Only his shed blood. In John chapter 4, Jesus and his disciples are walking through a region called Samaria. The people of this region, the Samaritans, uh, they didn't get along well with the Jews and vice versa. But not Jesus. uh, The Jews would usually avoid this region, but not Jesus. He goes through this region on this particular day. And as they came to the outskirts of one particular village, Jesus sat down by a well to have a rest. His disciples went into the village to grab some food. It was about noon, the hottest part of the day. Picking up the story in verse 7 of John 4, it says, When a Samaritan woman came to the well to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Jesus was overcoming a lot of barriers in this moment. First was the Jewish Samaritan, this ethnic barrier. There was also a gender barrier. Normally men didn't talk to women in those days, not not like Jesus was doing in this moment. But there was also a social barrier going on as well. And we only know that because we're reading between the lines, recognizing that this woman is going to a well at noon during the hottest part of the day to fetch water. Most most women and children would go to the well in the first part of the day or the end of the day, but she's going in the middle to avoid people during a non-COVID chapter in life, right? Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman doesn't know what Jesus is talking about yet because she responds, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water, she says. She thinks that Jesus is talking about the literal water from a literal well, but Jesus continues in verse 13. Everyone who drinks this water from this well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And in order to demonstrate, to show her what he means, Jesus says something to her. He says, go. Call your husband and bring him back to me. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus replied, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. It's quite true. Jesus in this moment is seeking to prove to her what he does to all of us at some point in life when we need to learn it. That all of us are thirsty. Not just physically thirsty. All of us are spiritually thirsty. We're all seeking to quench the thirst of our souls most of the time in ineffective and sometimes even inappropriate sort of ways. And this lady was seeking to quench the thirst of her soul through men. Now, ladies, listen up. No man can quench the thirst of your soul. Do I hear any amens out there? No man can do it. Men. No lady can quench the thirst of your soul. Thanks for not saying amen, men. Well done. 
well played. We try to quench the thirst of our souls in all sorts of other ways, don't we? Whether it's through our kids, our pets, here in Penticton, our pets are a big thing, um, money, stuff, education, accolades, doing good deeds, all those sorts of things that we're seeking to quench the thirst of our souls, but ultimately it just satisfies temporarily, and ultimately I believe it's poisoning our souls if we're seeking to, to, to quench the thirst of our souls in those sorts of ways. Those things, they, they don't even necessarily need to be bad things, but if we're doing it for the wrong reasons, then it will ultimately poison our souls, and it won't satisfy our deepest longings as well. So in a manner of speaking, Jesus in this moment is saying to this lady, lady, you need to drink from me. Let me give you my living water. It will change your life. It'll change your eternity. The amazing thing is that those of us that follow Jesus, that surrender our lives to him, that choose to make him our savior and our king, that we will not just drink this refreshing, renewing, life-giving water someday in the kingdom. We get to drink it today in the present tense. We get to experience his forgiveness. We get to experience the removal of shame and guilt, the healing of our bodies, our minds, our souls, our hearts today as well. And honestly, this has the power, I believe, to carry us through these crazy times that we live in. I'm going to put it out there. It has the power to do so. We've got to go to the well. We've got to go to the river every day. William Cooper, who wrote there, is a fountain that I just talked about here a few moments ago. He didn't live an easy life. This hymn was not written from a, an easy sort of living. Before the age of six, he lost four siblings and he lost his mama as well. He was hurting His dad sent him off to boarding school. And in boarding school, there was bullies there that just brought him almost to a place of nervous breakdown. In his 20s, his dad had plans for him to be a lawyer. But before he wrote the bar exam, he he basically had a nervous breakdown and he couldn't write the exam. And he tried to commit suicide several times. His friends said, you got to go to this, this asylum. This guy named Nathaniel Cotton, he'll help you. Nathaniel Cotton was a doctor and a Christian. And in the asylum, he slowly began to heal. At age 33, he read this verse in the book of Romans, Romans 3.25, and it changed his life. It says, For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God. They are made friends of God and no longer his enemies citizens of his kingdom when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. All of a sudden for Cooper, it made sense to him that life comes from Jesus' death, that he, the source of living water, wants to fill him today and every day for all eternity. And you'd like me to say in this moment that William Cooper lived happily ever after, wouldn't you? but he was a person like you and I. We have our ups and downs in life. In fact, until his dying day, William Cooper struggled emotionally. Every day he had to to drink from the waters of the living waters of Jesus Christ in order to get through those days. But God walked with him every step of the way, constantly giving him his supply of living water. In his 40s, Cooper wrote this lesser known hymn, a hymn that I've never learned. Some of you might know it. It's a hymn that's, that's titled, God Moves in a Mysterious Way. And it fits well these days that we are living in church. And I encourage you to listen to these lyrics here as we are waiting for the close of this final day of the Lord. Listen to the lyrics. God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and he rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and he works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, 
fresh courage take. This is for us today. You fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Can't you just feel the rain? I know you guys don't like rain, but I'm from Saskatchewan. Cut me some slack, right? (laughs) Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. A lot of us think God is frowning right now, and he might be, honestly. But behind the frown, there will be a smile someday, church. You can count on that. There will be a smile. His purpose will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Last verse. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. We've been living out that last verse, have we not, the past number of months? As we're wondering, God, what are you doing here with us and with planet Earth? And little by little, God is revealing his will and his plans to us. And I believe he continues to speak to us, even, uh, even in these weird moments that we are in. Church, though we are in strange, perhaps difficult days, I encourage you to take heart. It might seem like God is frowning in this moment, but we will see his smile someday. And I encourage you to stand strong, to be resolute in these days that we live in. Be disciplined. Do your part to strengthen your faith. If you do your part, God is assured to do his. He will do his part. Pray for a strong faith and do your part. We need strong faith muscles these days. And drink. Bet you never think I'd say that, did you? Drink. Today and every day from Jesus. The living water. Every day, accept his grace and his salvation. Just receive it over and over. Receive his love. Treasure his presence with us and his many blessings And realize that though we get sips of this living water today, one day we're just going to be, it just flow right over us. It'll be amazing. And that will be the day when we will dwell in the house of God. Zechariah 14 verse 9, I'm going to close with this verse, says, The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day there will be one Lord, and his name, the only name. Amen. Please stand. Let's pray together. Mm. Father, I can't speak for my church, but one person of your church, meaning me, I am so grateful for the book of Joel. How it has strengthened me for the days that I am in these days. I thank you, Lord, for how it guides us, how to respond to you, Lord, in repentance and in humility, how it gives us promise of what the future will look like as well. We thank you, Lord God, that in the end, you are sitting on the throne and we will be there with you as your people, drinking from the springs of living water. Lord Jesus, I pray that these days that we would, you would continue to just give us those sips of living water that we so long for, that we so need, that we would not find our security and our salvation in any other source, but just in you, Lord Jesus, as your church. We renounce these all in the name of Jesus, and we proclaim our allegiance to you in this moment. Give us strength for the journey ahead as your church, Lord. Remove the negativity from us. Help us to see the opportunity that is there before us as your church to make much of you, Lord, in this world that is looking for hope, that is looking for truth, that is looking for light, that is looking for the living water. 
Give us, give us a sense of urgency in the days that we live in, Lord. And God, if anyone is struggling, just needing healing this day, whether it's emotional or spiritual or physical, Lord, we extend our hands and pray, Lord, that you would just continue to pour out that living water into our lives. We accept your healing. We accept your love. We receive your forgiveness. And we receive, Lord, the empowerment of your Holy Spirit for the days that we live in. We love you, Jesus. We pray these things all. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please stay standing. Shar and your team, please come.